Hey all you cool cats and kittens, welcome back to another day here on Anti-Tools Farm. I'm Jared, he's Berkeley, and it's been like a mortal age since we last streamed. So, tell us what's new with you. Uh, or like, wait a minute, and we'll tell you what's new with us. Berkeley, what's new with us? Um, what's new with me is that the weather is starting to cool down. It's getting some signs of fall, and I love it. I've been going on bike rides occasionally in the evening, um, which is so good for my mental health and physical health and my knowledge of the neighborhood in which I live. So just really all around wins. The main thing for me, what's new with you? Um, I have a question for you before I answer that, Berkeley. When you say uh -huh. knowledge, would you say that you're like learning more about the layout or about the habits of your neighbors? Oh, definitely the layout. Okay. Yeah, I found out that there's this beautiful trail that just follows a river near my house. It takes me like three minutes to bike to it, and then I can just spend the rest of my bike ride on this river trail. And I did not know it was there. Wow. That's amazing. I would not have guessed that, having been in your neighborhood. Right? Well... I'm glad things are cooling off for you. Over here, it's the hottest day of the year. And I walked home from work today and felt like I was walking through an oven. It was amazing. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was it was pretty interesting, though, to like think about how weak and foolish people were before air conditioning. Yeah, I, I wonder why they didn't think about like getting air conditioning before. Yeah, I'm it was pretty silly of them not to do. Probably just too stupid to get AC back in the mm -hmm. 1800s. Yeah. Actually, though, I've heard, and I think we talked about this. Maybe Susie Moo mentioned this. Um, back in the day, they used to have houses designed specifically to be cool in the summer, in really mm -hmm. hot places that were just built differently but we a lot of people live in stick frame houses because it's cheaper and easier to mass produce but um back in the day at least in the arizona neck of the woods they used to build super super thick like multiple feet thick adobe wall houses with special window configurations so it would create a cross breeze and keep things cool naturally which is just kind of amazing to think about designing a house to stay cool, you know, instead of just running the AC full blast and trusting yeah. that. Interesting. Uh, Yo, Babarma, thanks for joining us. Been a while. All right, so if you haven't joined us before, we are playing Stardew Valley without using any tools. We finished the community center a while ago, and now we're slowly working our way towards perfection. So the main things we're working on is Jared is trying to get full friendship points with everyone, and I'm working on scaling up our income so that we can buy all the very expensive buildings that the wizard has graciously agreed to sell us for millions and millions of gold. How rich is the wizard? Um, well, not at all yet. We need to <laughs> buy buildings from him for millions and millions of gold. All right. That that made sense. We had a goat at one point, and I cannot find it. Uh, Yeah, we did. We used to get cheese, didn't we? Yeah. Maybe the pigs ate it. That makes sense. Does it? <laughs> I recently listened to a podcast that just summarized the book Animal Farm. Ah. And so I totally believe that a pig could, uh, could eat, eat a goat? another farm animal. Yep. What is the plot of Animal Farm? If you could sum it up in four words. Um, Russian Revolution with animals. Wow, that was great. Thanks. Um, it yeah, that's probably the easiest book to summarize in four words out of all the books. <laughs> Have you read it? Are you familiar with it? Or was that tongue in cheek? I read it many moons ago in middle school. And 
weirdly the book didn't make too much of an impression on me the film however was quite grotesque from what i remember yeah i think i watched the same film as you maybe in the same class <laughs> maybe the yeah the way they did the pigs was it was intense the cinematography on that was top tier which is amazing because as far as story complexity goes it ain't that deep i don't think yeah it's kind of tale as old as time revolutionaries become despots there's a hey there's a three word summary for you you could just tack hey on the end to make it four words revolutionaries become despots hey hey yo <laughs> <laughs> uh revolutionaries become desperate despots welp well something like that here we are again no <laughs> lots of words you could tack on at the end speaking of revolutionaries becoming despots you got to finish the series the book series that you have told us all about so many times and you convinced me to read i'm i'm four books deep the f sixth one just got published Yes. And you have read it once and started reading it a second time? Yes. Is that what you told me? Yep. So, so first question, what motivated you to read it a second time right away? I did not like it as much as I liked the fifth book. And I finished it, went on vacation twice, and then came back and thought, I've cleansed my palate. It's time to give it another shot and see what I think interesting i don't think i've ever heard someone reread a book that fast out of uh not liking it the first time <laughs> out of spite <laughs> <laughs> out of maybe curiosity is that fair out of rage yeah no uh, i think uh, so the fourth book iron gold kind of hit me the same way where it was just a departure from the book before it in a significant mm. enough way that it felt uh, jarring, but I could still tell that the book had potential. It was still well written. So I've reread that several times since I first read it, and I've enjoyed it more each time. But sometimes that's uh, sometimes it's a long road, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. To becoming comfortable with change, especially in a series that you really like. Mm. So um so uh, yeah there's there's one more book after this one and there's a, still a lot to be wrapped up but i would say overall first reread i would have given it a six out of ten which is you know mostly because a lot of things change and in ways that i didn't expect and i think as an author you always want to try to surprise or at least uh, intrigue your audience, you know, bring in new things that they maybe didn't consider. I think that that's part of your value as an author is to get people thinking, but also to controvert their expectations. Um, and Pierce Brown definitely did that. Almost nothing that I had expected from the original, or not the original, but from the previous book to carry through did. It was... Hmm crazy but on reading it again it makes more sense um but i will say that i think there's still some things that i'm not fully buying into yet we'll see mm -hmm. i don't feel like the author has really damaged the series in any, in any way it still stands up but um it's just not quite the same caliber as dark age but dark age is a masterpiece in my opinion so not everything you write can be better than the last thing every time <laughs> yeah yeah that's one of the things that has struck me with reading the first four books is just how much you can tell the author is improving as he goes yeah um i've i've enjoyed every book but like from an entertainment standpoint i think they've all been good from like just the writing quality it has been a marked improvement from book to book which is cool to see yeah
Yeah, it's interesting to note that this this book has taken the longest to come out. I think he worked on this for four or five years, whereas the others came out yearly. So, you know, it's obvious that the author kind of struggled with the story that they wanted to tell. And they eventually had to, I don't know if compromise is the right word, but they eventually had to um, pick a direction and move forward, right? And I, that's something I try to do with my music a lot now as well. Instead of waiting to publish something until it's perfect and then just never publishing anything, <clears throat> Patrick Rothfuss, um, <laughs> <laughs> just try to move forward with what you have and do the best that you can now and then accept that, you know, there's going to be opportunities to improve and grow later and, uh, putting out work that you have and finishing work that you have is going to teach you more than sitting around and not doing anything because you're not sure what to do. Would mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I strongly agree. I am frantically trying to get all of our kegs filled with fruit. I should check these before 10 p.m. <laughs> Especially if I'm going to forget to bring enough fruit to refill them. Do you need a hand? I think I've got it now. Third okay. time's the charm. Okay. First time I didn't bring any fruit. Second time I brought almost enough fruit. <laughs> Third time brought enough. The way these fish swim, they look like shrimps. That's um, weird. Brenda in the chat says she thinks that you know she's lurking <laughs> with what you've been saying about music and putting <laughs> stuff out into the world. <laughs> Welcome, Brenda, in the chat. Um, I didn't know you were there, but I'm I'm glad that that resonated with you. It's, I think that's, for me as an artist, the biggest struggle is being happy with what I'm making. And maybe that's not the point sometimes. Maybe the point is just to make and, and grow through. It's like a weird, almost self-acceptance in a way, maybe. I don't know. Take it how you will. <laughs> Berkeley... Right. Go ahead. Good news and bad news on day one. Bad news is I didn't make it to bed and passed out outside of our house. <laughs> Good news, we just made 64,000 gold. I think that's a record for us. Oh, but far and away. Yeah, that's nuts. This is, yeah, great day. Sold 20 bottles of wine. Sold a whole slew of truffles. 18 truffles. Jeez Louise. Good for us. Who's who's buying this stuff? Mayor Lewis, I think, canonically. <laughs> really? Yeah. He when on the first day that you move into town, he wow. says that anything you leave in the shipping bin, he'll come and uh change for money. That's crazy. That's gotta be laundering. There's no way that he has that <laughs> much money legitimately. Yeah, it's all it's all counterfeit. <laughs> But the whole town just decides to go along with it because we've all been duped the same way. Berkeley, there is a great movie that centers around money counterfeiting called uh, Lupin the Third, The Count of Cagliostro. And it's a Studio Ghibli movie, one of the early ones. It's very 80s anime. But it is such a great adventure and really interesting world building and visuals. If you are in the mood for an action movie with a little bit of a twist in terms of the setting and vibe, strongly recommend Count of Cagliostro. Hmm. And I think it's on Netflix, if you're if that sounds up your alley. Cool, thanks for the recommendation. I'm very curious how there can be a twist in the setting and vibe, because usually that's like what you find out in the first three minutes of a movie. You know, I uh, maybe I'm just not explaining things <laughs> accurately. <laughs> <laughs> what you think is going to happen and what actually happens I don't know it's hard to explain watch it and then let me know if you felt like that was a fair description 
cool. Berkeley, you mentioned to me that you've been putting some work in on a game that isn't Stardew Valley. Oh, I wouldn't call it work. It is just so delightfully fun. Yeah, um, who who in the chat's playing Baldur's Gate 3? I want to hear, uh, if you're playing it, let me know how far you've gotten and what class you're playing. If you are playing and... it, you should also say Pip Pip Cheerio for me. Yeah, Jared wants to hear you say Pip Pip Cheerio if you're playing it. Thanks. Megan in the chat's playing. How far are you? What class are you playing? Um, and I will start describing it. So this game has been in the works for a long time. They had a really long open access period, like years long, I think, where you wow. could play part of the game, kind of like a, a demo that was out to get feedback on it. Um, so this is like a fantasy RPG game, but it is all based on Dungeons & Dragons. So all the same mechanics that you would get playing Dungeons & Dragons are in the game. Almost all of them. It's like, I, I was blown away how similar the rules are. So all the combat is turn-based. Uh, you have a party of people that you're controlling instead of just a single character. Um, you have like one main character that is your character, but then you've got, you pick up friends along the way that also travel with you and battle with you. Um, there's a really cool plot where, uh, this is spoilers for the first hour of the game, um, but you've been infected by these alien parasites and uh, you're trying to find a cure Dang. and figure out what the aliens are doing, putting parasites in people. That's hardcore. Yeah, so like really gripping story from the very beginning. Uh, lots of cool side quests and things to do. Uh, it has just been really delightful. The game is beautiful. Uh, lots of really good voice acting. Lots of really good scenery. Overall, can't recommend it enough. It's very good. Berkeley, do you... Um, was it a big download? Is it like a like a hard drive hog? Yes, probably the biggest game I've ever played. It was really? like 140 gigabytes, I think. Dang, that's crazy. Yeah. But worth it. Um, yeah, worth it, in my opinion. I mean, if you don't have 140 gigs, then you don't have 140 gigs. But um, yeah. Yeah, what else to say about it? Uh, okay, Megan wants me to give all her answers because it's too annoying to type it all out. Megan is playing a fighter, a, a half-elf fighter, I think, maybe full-elf. And she has finished Act 1 but has not moved on to Act 2 because every time she tries, the game says, you are not high enough level for this. So she, uh, she finished... Well, what that really means is she was just so good at Act 1 that she finished it before the level that they thought she needed. Hmm. Um, I don't I know. Playing... Maybe that means you're missing something. That's all I'm going to say. I'm playing a human warlock, and I am not as far as Megan. Berkeley, tell us a little bit more about warlocks for the uninitiated. They're magic -y, but they're, like, emo magic -y? Question uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> in Dungeons and Dragons, there's a few different like classes of characters that have magical powers. Um, you've got your wizards, who are like your book smarts people. You've got your sorcerers, who are just like innately powerful. And uh, then you've got your warlocks, who make a deal with some sort of demon or god or other worldly being to get their powers. And uh, so, yeah, a, a lot of them are kind of emo uh, my character is not that way and they they didn't really like put in the deities for warlocks and clerics and the like and paladins um so that part of the game is maybe you could call it missing compared to dungeons and dragons um but mechanically it's all the same like you still got your eldritch blast your eldritch invocations i i picked the subclass of warlock that gets a familiar so once a day i can like create a little magical animal that will travel with me what animal um, it varies. You've got like eight options. Oh. I've got a frog right now. Did you name him Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> I should have. 
Okay, Megan says, half-elf fighter, yes. I have done lots of cool things and also seduced two party members successfully. And wow. I completed Act 1 because I accidentally cheated. Uh, she didn't cheat. She just looked at a strategy guide. I think that's that's on the table. I um, I feel that. I, I had to look up how to solve a puzzle in Tears of the Kingdom. And my wife was like... You, do you do that? Are you supposed to do that? Do you allow <laughs> yourself to do that? And I was like a little ashamed of myself because maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't have to, maybe I should have just tried a little harder anyways. Yeah. I, I vary from game to game on my approach there. Yeah. If it's like Assassin's Creed or Skyrim, the minute the, no, the second, the second I knew I was in a puzzle, I was like on my phone looking up a, <laughs> A guide on how to do it because yeah. the puzzles just were not the interesting part of the game for me. Oh, okay, yeah. But like Zelda, I'll give it a good five or ten minutes of effort before I give up. Spoken like a true gifted child. So Baldur's Gate three. Um, Lots of people are streaming it right now. If you're curious, if you want to learn more about the gameplay before you get into it, I will say, I think it would probably have a pretty steep learning curve. If you haven't played anything like Dungeons and Dragons, not, it doesn't need to be Dungeons and Dragons specifically, but like any tabletop RPG, um, I think it would be kind of tough to get the hang of the rules, but I have seen lots of people online say that they did not have any experience and are still having fun with this one. Um, Anyway, yeah, you can find lots of people streaming it if you want to check it out for free that way. And, uh, yeah, consider playing. We're pretty sure that their streams are not as cool as our stream, though. Yeah, definitely Just not. if you're considering leaving to go watch their stream. Right, yeah, this... yeah, after we're done here. <laughs> that's when. Good call out, thank you. We know, that, we know that they're not that cool. No, everyone should leave immediately. <laughs> go, read some books. <laughs> all right berkeley if you had a neighbor that ran around handing out fruit to everyone they saw every day what would what would you think about them would that creep you out a little bit maybe i think it depended on everything else like if they were a little bit awkward i would feel very awkward about it but if they were just like a nice, pleasant person, I think I would be very on board. Mm. Um, regardless of how I felt, I would call them fruit boy. <laughs> hey, it look. would either be a compliment or derogatory. <laughs> <laughs> it's fruit boy. Here comes fruit boy. That would be a weird, it's like superpower, like superhero name. Fruit boy. Poison Ivy's boyfriend. Yeah. And his whole thing is that he just sells fruit. He doesn't have a superpower. <laughs> I think you're kind of stretching the definition of the term super superhero then. Everybody thinks that he, because he's dating a supervillain, everybody thinks he's a, oh, got superpowers. Oh, I see. Berkeley, our dog has been trapped in this corner for months, and I've tried to clear a way for it to get out several times, and it just can't. Ooh, are you sure? I feel like it spawns in our house every day. It probably teleports back and forth, but every time I come out here, it's up here. Huh. Poor dog. Well, I mean, it is immortal, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing fine. <laughs> Jared, you were telling me about a really interesting movie premise that you you said you've seen done several times. Oh, man. Okay. Do you guys ever look at the billion-dollar lottery ticket and think, what would I do if I won the lottery? I think that. But the movie premise is kind of like that, except that it's an inheritance thing. So the movie is called Brewster's Millions, and I believe it's the most remade movie of all time. It's got a bunch of different versions. I've seen three of them. There's several old ones and then a more modern one. And by more modern, maybe maybe 80s. It was in color, which tells you how old the other ones are. Um, 
and the concept is that a uh, relative you didn't know you had who's super wealthy dies, leaves their money to you in their will. But in order to keep the fortune, you have to spend a certain amount of it within a certain timeline. So I think one of them is you have to spend $30 million in a month. And then there's stipulations. Like sometimes it's you can't gamble. Sometimes it's that you can't buy stocks, et cetera, et cetera. So I find it fascinating because if you had to, like inherently people when they win the lottery are wasteful with their money, right? But Mm. it's one thing to want things and then buy them it's quite another to have to go broke and you can't donate it all or whatever. You know, you have to actually spend it on things. And maybe it was more exciting in the world of pre-internet where (laughs) somebody half a world away could call you up and say, hey, buy this rare stone or this rare car for $30 million. Um, But... I find it quite interesting. I'd love to know what you guys would do. I think I would probably buy like, do like a currency exchange with failed currency, you know, and then once it collapses, Uh, trade it back. Sorry, I don't know what you mean by that. Oh, so like you can exchange money for like dollars for like euros, for example. Okay. So if you found a country that was having hyperinflation and you traded all your money into their type of currency and then let it devalue and then traded it back, that would be a great way to get rid of a lot of money without actually (laughs) buying stocks or doing anything else crazy. Okay. So your goal in this scenario is really to like get rid of the money. You don't want to like, buy 30 houses and then sell the 30 houses in another year you're like really trying to lose that value you know i don't think that you necessarily have to lose it but you do have to spend it so maybe my definition wouldn't even work or maybe my idea wouldn't even work based on the rules but yeah that's how i'm interpreting is you have to actually lose the money like if you make money back Right, like if you buy the houses, what do you do with the houses? Just leave them vacant? Probably not. You gotta do something. Otherwise, well, I guess maybe they'd get repossessed. I don't know. Yeah. But Barma says he'd invest in Trump businesses. <laughs> it seems like a pretty safe thing to bet against. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I think another interesting one would be buying all those mattress retail stores that are always empty. Mm. My wife and I are convinced that there is some money laundering going on with mattress firm in, in the neighborhood where she grew up because there are like, there's two of them that are right next to each other, share a parking lot and there's never any customers in either of them. Dude. I don't know how you can have two mattress firms that share a parking lot. How did they make money? How like who owns them? I don't know. That's crazy. Mr. Firm, probably. Mr. Firm. M Firm. <laughs> you can call or me maybe Matt. It's just like an unrelated financial institution run by a guy named Mattress. <laughs> I think I, having the name Mattress would be really rough. That would not be I think so too. Okay, if I was really trying to get rid of that much money that quickly, I wonder how fast you could lose money just, like, shopping online. It would be fun to just find small, like, Etsy shop owners and buy tons of stuff. Yeah. Um, You would have a problem when all that stuff arrived at your house, and then it was, you know, taking up space. That's true. You could burn it, and then you could get fined a bunch of times. Oh, yeah. Fines is probably a quick way to lose a bunch of money. Speeding tickets, etc. What? What? I just want to know what types of things you can get fined for that won't negatively impact your life long term. 
like <laughs> speeding tickets can have a definite like i guess you could make your car insurance so expensive by getting yeah. tons and tons of tickets but at what point do you think they just wouldn't insure you anymore you know you know i had never even thought of the concept of not being able to be insured anymore until you know with climate change there's states where it's hard to get certain types of insurance which is just bonkers yeah yeah and that just goes to show you that if you actually need it it's not available so what is insurance a ponzi scheme hmm. anyways anyways <laughs> yeah it's it's weird to me that and like 401ks also just are weird to me where it's like we're just gonna have everybody instead of giving them pensions we're gonna have everybody invest in the stock market because that usually works out well for people i don't know oh my goodness we have so many rewards here oh at the museum yeah Ooh, ancient seed and recipe for ancient seed oh nice all right now we know how to make ancient seed, I guess. Yeah, I got that one a while ago, but uh, oh. it's cool that you have it too. Wow, look at that humble brag. I think we just got the last rare crow. It looks like a weird koala or raccoon, maybe? I feel like there's at least one more we haven't gotten yet because um, you need to buy it. There's one that you can buy from that, like, casino that the bouncer is blocking off. Oh, uh, I don't okay. think we've gotten through the bouncer yet. Okay. It said 7 of 8 when I looked at it, so probably, oh, yeah. They all have, like, unique numbers. It's, that doesn't mean you've gotten 7 uh, okay. of them. That means you found the one with ID 7. Well, now you know. <laughs> What a journey. Well, I have been reading a book as well. It is not as topical as the sixth entry in the Red Rising series, but it does relate to stuff we've talked about before. Um, we've talked in the past about um, creative writing, and I shared like a list of recommendations of books and other media that can help you learn how to write better. And I have found a new one um, that my mom recommended to me. I was going to hold it up, but it's not in this room, which would make that very difficult. <laughs> um, so the book is called A Swim in the Pond, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. Um, and it is written by a professor who teaches short stories. And he has picked seven of his favorite Russian short stories and uses them to teach you how to critique and write short stories. And um, I know like short stories isn't everyone's jam, but I have found the book super fascinating. Um, it's, it's really cool to have... <laughs> Brenda says it feels like I know she's lurking in the chat as well. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I was planning on bringing this up already, though. Um, it's super fascinating to read literature side by side with an expert critiquing it. Um, it it's like getting to watch the director's commentary on a movie. Um, it's it's just really new insights, teaching me how to think about the art in new ways that I really appreciate. Um, and it's been cool that it's geared both towards like reading and writing. I think the author has bounced back and forth between those two really well. So even if you're not into writing, if you want to just be able to learn to read more critically um, and maybe appreciate some of the things the authors are doing better, I think this would be a great book to check out. So that's A Swim in the Pond, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. Brickley, why does the book have that title? I am two thirds of the way through and haven't the foggiest so far. All right. Maybe it tested well with focus groups. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that'll be the big reveal in the last chapter. <laughs> I also want to, I just need to call out. Um, so I have read, I just started the fifth out of the seven stories that are included in it. 
the first four were all like two local men have a singing competition at the pub or a lonely girl rides in a cart on her way home from work uh, things like that um yeah. all very beautiful stories but like that kind of older genre that i think most of us probably don't use for entertainment these days then i got to the fifth one and the plot is a guy wakes up and his nose is missing <laughs> And he runs around town and sees his nose just walking around. I had his grown legs and is walking around. And he tries to convince it to come home with him. And it says, I've never met you before in my life. Wow. He goes to the newspaper and says, please publish an advertisement telling people to look out for my nose. And the newspaper says, that is fake news and we will not do that. <laughs> This was written in 1836, which I feel like is ahead of its time for just the level of absurdism. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, delightful. Berkeley, does that remind you at all of the uh, story told inside uh, Wise Man's Fear? The boy with the golden screw? Oh, it does. Um, let me catch up on the chat and then do you want to summarize that one for me? Sure. <laughs> Okay. Oh, Babarma says Ray Bradbury wrote a great book on how to write good stories. I'm trying to remember the title. That sounds fantastic. I will look that up after if uh, if you don't remember the title. And Brenda says sounds sounds Kafka esque. Yeah, that's exactly what Megan said when I when I was telling her about it. When was Kafka active? Does anyone know? I'm gonna feel silly if I said that 1836 was ahead of its time for absurdism. I guess like Rip Van Winkle was before that. So people knew how to be silly for sure. You know, it just totally caught me off guard. That's actually really weird to think about Rip Van Winkle existing pre civil war. That really makes me question my assumptions about how people behaved and thought. I could be wrong. I, um, I have no idea, oh, but is it Rip Van Winkle and not Rip Van Wrinkle? Yeah. Winkle. Oh, I've been saying that wrong. For a long time. And it was published <laughs> no. in 1819. So yeah. Dang. War. Megan knows nothing about Kafka and she refuses to learn. That's fair. It's all fun and games until you wake up as a bug and don't know what to do. Well, um, I think the answer is just lay in bed and die. Which is, I think, what happened. <laughs> so... If that Dang, helps you understand. Not a lot of useful advice there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I feel of... like it kind of summarizes a certain niche of the Russian psyche, though. I don't know. It was not, it's never been fun to be a Russian subject. We'll put it that way. Unless you were that one specific subject that got to say, no, I will not publish a story about your nose being missing. That's true. They probably went home clicking their heels. Metamorphosis is from 1915. Okay. So a hundred years apart, Rip Van Winkle and Metamorphosis. How different do they feel? Not that different. Berkeley, can I feed apricots to the big old pig attached to the pig cart? Nope, but that would make a great mod. I just ate a daffodil. Hmm. <laughs> Jared, if you had to choose between waking up and finding out that you had missed a civil war in your country or a revolutionary war, depending on your perspective or waking up and finding out that you were a bug, which would you pick? hundred percent missing the war. That's, I mean, that's just awesome to not have to live through the suffering and chaos. That's great. Okay. Wait. But what if part of it was you accidentally went to a pub afterwards and swore your allegiance to the previous government, not knowing that a civil war had occurred. Okay. That's less fun, but it does depend on the government in this situation. Am I swearing to the British? 
Um, I think you, we'd have to pick, choose your current situation. So, like, you you stand up to say the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of a sports game. I, they don't do that, do they? Um, I they, I feel like they probably do that, or they sing the national anthem. Maybe maybe you're singing at the sports game, and nobody's checked that you're going to sing the right anthem, and you sing the wrong anthem because you don't know that the anthem is the same <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Here we go. Great analogy. <laughs> that would be pretty terrible, but still well, better be than being a bug game. for forever. Yeah. Okay. What if that all happened and you had a beard that went to your toes? Uh... I'm just going to keep adding complications from Rip Van Winkle until it balances <laughs> out. <laughs> I don't think that there's many things that could make me want to be a bug. Okay, that's fair. I give up. Like a beard? Okay, I'll shave. Boom. Done. Barma says, but what if you had to spend your life bowling? <gasps> Did you even think about that? I didn't think about that. Spending my life bowling? Am I old? I'm old in that situation, so that's not that much life. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I could I could do 10 to 15 years of bowling before I die, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Berkeley, do trees only grow when it rains if you plant them in the desert? Oh, I wonder. That might be the case. We got... Yeah, they sure do seem to be growing slow out there. Oh, yeah. We've got a lot of trees out there that are not fully grown. I have started putting a little bit of lemon juice in my water bottle after I fill it up because yeah. there's just so much calcium in the water here that it's disgusting and I haven't been drinking enough water as a result. So I'm trying to counterbalance that with more flavors. Yeah. Anyway, I keep forgetting because I've only been doing this the last two or three days. And so every time I have a sip of water from this water bottle, it's like a fun little surprise. How much lemon juice are you putting in? Just a little bit too much. That's how <laughs> I like to do it. <laughs> Take what you think would be a good amount. and then Yeah, and then like another 20% after that. <laughs> <laughs> So I recently, I always grew up squeezing my own lemons when I needed lemon juice. Never had store-bought oh, juice. Finally went and got some store-bought juice, lemon juice. And that stuff is super bitter. And it doesn't taste anything like the real deal. Even though, oh. ostensibly, it is the real deal. So I don't <laughs> know what... sure the, what they would have you think. Right? It's, I'm, I'm not happy. It's not measuring up. And I still have like 30 ounces of it left because I, nobody wants to drink straight lemon juice, especially if it's really bitter. Right. Yeah. That's not something you go through very quickly. Well, yeah, that, I'm sorry. That's definitely a double-edged sword growing up with natural stuff like that. I'm that way with pancakes. I, I've eaten a lot of uh, pancakes made from like store-bought mix and I'm, I'm getting used to it now, but growing up used to have them from scratch all the time and it was hard to uh get used to anything else mm -hmm. yeah that's the that's the reality like almost everything is better when it's homemade i think the exception in my opinion has been french fries i've i've had some pretty good homemade french fries but i've never had homemade french fries that quite lived up to in the store french fries I'm not sure mm. why that is. Probably the hardware. My big one, my big one is brownies. I'll take that oh. Betty Crocker any day. Berkeley, you were telling me that there's a place. So crumble cookie is like a huge thing in Utah. We just got one near where I live. Mm. But you said that yeah, there's actually. Yeah, they've gone worldwide. A... Or not worldwide, nationwide. But uh, yeah, def definitely started in Utah. But there's a better place that you told me about that actually makes different and more desserts, including like brownie brick, maybe? Yeah. Oh, man. 
Um, okay, here's my confession. I can never remember what the place is called. <laughs> it's either called Bricks or Blocks. <laughs> and they sell lots of like cookie adjacent things that are square shaped. I bet it's big. Blocks. I bet it's Blocks. Blocks sounds right to me. I think it's Blocks too, yeah. And you said it's too big? Yeah, j- just like a crumble cookie is too big, you know? Like um, you're going to eat it, but you're not going to be happy about it. No, they are too big. And then like also... In my opinion, crumble cookies are too soft. It feels like I'm eating like a handful of flour and Mm. no thanks. (laughs) Yeah, that's fair. Okay, Megan has confirmed it's blocks, not bricks. Your intuition was better than my memory. Well, Um, you when you told me about the first time you said blocks, so you got it right at least once. Oh, okay. Huh. I don't know. I have such a hard time remembering. I don't think you do. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm gonna gaslight you into believing in yourself. Oh. Oh, thanks? I just Question walked mark? into a fight. Er, I wow. always clean under the cushions. It's your turn this week. Trash emoji. You're being childish, Haley. I do the vast majority of work in this house, and you know it. Ah, <gasps> uh, they've noticed me. Oh, it's that new farm boy. I have a name, and I've been living here for two years. <laughs> Come on. He has a name, you know. That's right, Emily. What you said. Hey, I bet you'll understand my point of view here. Okay, just pro tip, guys. If you're ever having an argument, don't immediately try to get other people to jump in on it. Settle it <laughs> between the two advice. of you like an adult. Mm-hmm. Sai, I'm really sorry to involve you in this, Jared. Haley's complaining because I asked her to clean under the cushions. It's only because I cleaned them last week. Okay, here are my options, Berkeley. Stop whining and just clean it. Haley, why not have this be your one weekly job? (laughs) That's so passive aggressive. (laughs) Or three, Emily, take the high road and do it this time. All right. Chat, put in your votes. One, two, or three. And Berkeley also, I want to hear what you th- what you would say in this situation. Usually on these ones, I try to guess what's going to get me the most friendship points with them. But on this specific conversation, I always, always, always say the passive-aggressive one. <laughs> Why can't this just be your one job, Haley? <laughs> <laughs> All right. The tough thing Making here is the that... The chat we... says number two as well. Number two, okay. We don't know whose cutscene this is. So, like... Mm-hmm. Oh, it's weird. Also, fun fact: the little fern in the in the pot to the top left, kind of by the desk with the yard of fabric on it, looks like a mm-hmm. big tomato just sitting on the ground. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. Okay, number two. That's all the votes. That's all the votes. Okay. Oh, oh, there's two exclamation point, which might be two factorial, which is still two. So, all right, that's a fun fact. <laughs> two, two Mac, times Mac one. Math with Sleepy Berkeley. Is two. All right. I said it. Haley sighs and rolls her eyes and makes trash emoji. All right, you win. I guess this can be my job every week. Then there won't be any reason to argue over it. Facts. Facts. Emily says, thanks, Jared. That was a great solution. You're welcome. I feel like the guy who... Who cut the Gordian knot nope who cut the baby Solomon for suggesting that Haley do one dang thing around here oh yeah I'm I'm an arbiter of justice and I hold the lives <laughs> of this valley in my hands <laughs> <sighs> ooh it is berry day oh boy I am gonna pick so many berries that's very exciting (laughs) you like that one i am ambivalent towards it i just felt like it warranted a groan it did it definitely did by the way you were talking about pancakes earlier i came up with another lame joke what would you what would you call pancakes if the lady who waits at the bus stop here in stardew valley made it for you pancakes (laughs) pancakes 
Oh dear. Isn't Pam also like a brand of spray oil? Yes. So that's another way you could get pancakes. Ooh, just fried oil? Just well, stuck I mean, you on gotta crusty spray the, oil? You gotta spray the pan before you put the cake in it. Oh, so you're saying a real pancake with Pam oil. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of just burned on crusty old cake of oil. Which is canonically okay. the only food in Herson World. That's oh not Herson World again. <laughs> Um, if you're not familiar with Herson World, that's from our D&D podcast, which brings me to the next topic I want to talk about, which is a different D&D podcast. Ah, uh-huh, yes. Um, it is the Adventure Zone. Um, so this is by the McElroys, who are probably most famous for My Brother and, My Brother and Me, which is their like comedy podcast. You might have heard it um, called Mabim Bam as well. Mabim Bam, yeah. Um, so it's three brothers, and then also on on the adventure zone is their dad three brothers and their dad they're all comedians they're all hilarious um and they play dungeons and dragons together and uh they've done like lots of different seasons where they'll play different games and different settings but their first one is my favorite um they just do like a high fantasy adventure they're so silly the whole time but over the like 70 ish episodes of the first season of the show it becomes like so touching and so epic. Um, it kind of like Doctor Who vibes. If you're into Doctor Who at any point, where just everything's so emotional and so high stakes. Since since the Adventure Zone has come out, I've kind of gotten a taste for more like cozy, low stakes stories in general. But the Adventure Zone definitely holds up. Um, so yeah, I've been re-listening to that, and just so funny, so many feelings. I like I was crying a little bit while driving on the freeway the other day while listening to it and that's not a great thing to do but uh it was fulfilling. Yeah, I'll bet. I feel like crying anytime I'm on the freeway in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a big fan of the Adventure Zone. They inspired us to do the D&D podcast we did or at least they inspired me. And then Oh, that's right. Yeah, you uh when we were first talking about doing the D&D podcast, you, that's when you introduced me to them. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I i didn't know that, but I'm glad that I was able to spread the love. It's really quite funny. There's so many good storylines or story arcs, and it starts out as being really silly and continues to be really silly. But, man, I don't know. You said it when you said it just gets really personal, personal and meaningful and beautiful over time and one of the best like non-linear storytelling i've ever seen they do five arcs i think maybe six arcs that are like real time and then they do another arc that is set back in time and then come back to real time for the finale and it is just pulled off so well it's better written than most tv shows that i've seen in the last two years to be honest for sure and it's just it's just four guys. They just did it for fun. In their I don't I don't know where they record. Maybe their respective basements. Yeah. Maybe their offices. But just at home. It's just four guys. Yep. Very impressive. It is very impressive. And it's free also. And they have some really good live shows too, by the way. They do live mm. shows where they go play D D live in front of an audience. And surprisingly, it works out great, which if you've ever played D&D live with other live human beings, that's not usually how things go. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, if you want to taste, um, they've got one of their live shows up on Spotify or whatever other platform you listen to podcasts on. It's called The Dadlands. Um, that, that one is hilarious. That one was not Dungeons & Dragons. It was a new system they made up where you can choose to be like a lawful dad or a chaotic dad. <laughs> and it, yeah, it, it was great. Chat classify Berkeley's dad type. Another 36,000. This is... 
we're doing really well. We are doing really well. How how close are we to half a mil? Good question. Oh, I still gotta go get the. I gotta get hardwood so that we can do the the uh, house upgrade here. Oh no, we did a house upgrade. I need to cook. I need to get cooking. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, oh we're at 424,000. We're very close to half a million gold. Wow. So in the next two days, if we keep earning the way we have, we're going to make yeah. it. Megan in the chat says I'm a gamer dad because I let Charlotte watch me play uh, Breath of the Wild. Oh, nice. That's a great... I feel like that's a pretty kid-friendly game as far as... Yeah. You know, maybe not the control scheme, but like the... <laughs> Yeah, good to watch anyway. Yeah. Um, oh, Jared, I think we're at time. Should we uh, save this for next week? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. If you are listening to us for the first time, check the description of this video or the About section of our Twitch page to find our Linktree link. That will take you to our Instagram. Uh, we also have a Discord now. So if you want to talk yeah. about things... We share lots of interesting random things that we think about. I recently shared a picture of a hotel painting that was actually made by AI, um, which we talk a lot about AI on the stream. So if you want to see that, see some thoughts, share some thoughts, um, or just, you know, lurk in the background, uh, hit us up. Let me tell you a story about our Discord. I had finished a very stressful work day and I was uptight and uh babarma dropped two album recommendations and i put them on and they were so relaxing <laughs> they like totally fixed my mood issues that day so thank you babarma came just in time so if you need that relaxation in your life go to the discord right now right away let your anxiety fuel you to get there and then let the beautiful music wash it away <laughs> all right yep Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you. See you next week. Bye. Bye.